This video focuses on three critical thermal concepts, internal energy, temperature, and energy in transfer, often called heat or heat energy. I'm going to start this video by introducing a very simple model of a solid. It's not a particularly realistic model, as you'll see, but it does what a good model does. It's simple, and it explains the stuff that we need to explain. And what I'd like to explain, first of all, is what's different between a solid, a liquid, and a gas, and how is it that a solid could change into a liquid and then into a gas. So I'm start, going to start by drawing a few of the particles that could be atoms or molecules within a solid. Here's a few of my, my particles. They'd be in a three-dimensional lattice, something like that. I'm just going to focus in on this molecule here and this molecule here and consider the forces between those two molecules. I'm going to represent those forces by springs. So the particles have electrons and protons in them, and that means there's going to be attractive and repulsive forces between the molecules. So let me put the springs in, something like that, and then I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. I'm going to put a rod coming down vertically between my two springs, something like that. And then I'm going to finish it up by drawing a cylinder. The cylinder is going to be attached to the two springs, so the two springs are attached to that cylinder. And in the solid case, that little cylinder, I'm going to call it a slider. So in the solid case, that slider is going to have a little speck of glue on it, and it's going to keep the cylinder fixed on the rod. Now, of course, our, our molecules are vibrating around. They'd be vibrating in all directions. And if we heat up our solid, then the vibrations get bigger. And if they get big enough, our little speck of glue is going to break. And that'll mean that this cylinder is going to be able to move up and down the rod. And that's when we get a liquid. So you might have noticed that a solid and a liquid have approximately equal densities. And that's because the molecules don't particularly get farther apart or closer together. There's simply a new degree of freedom. In this case, that's being represented by this slider going up and down the rod. But with this new degree of freedom, a liquid becomes a liquid. It's something that can flow and take on the shape of the container that it's in. Now, if we keep adding heat and the vibrations keep getting bigger and bigger, we eventually, at least in this model, just kind of blow everything apart. And the springs and the rods and the sliders all disappear. So in our gas, everything breaks apart. The springs, the rods, the sliders, they all disappear. And of course, the particles get a lot farther apart. And that's why gases are much, much less dense than liquids or solids. So if you keep this very simple model in mind, I think everything in this thermal physics unit is going to fall into place for you really, really easily. Now, I said that we were going to talk about three main thermal concepts in this video. Temperature, heat, and internal energy. Let's start with internal energy. What do we mean by the internal energy of an object? We simply mean the energy of the particles in that object. And what's meant by particles here is either molecules or atoms. Now, note here, this does not include the energy that's internal to the particle. So perhaps an electron within the particle is shaking around. We're not talking about that, because that, that's internal to the particle. And we're also not talking about energy that's external to the object itself. So for instance, if I take my object and I throw it, that object as a whole would have kinetic energy. We're not talking about that because it would be an external energy. And when we were talking about energy, we said that there's two fundamental types of energy. We said that there was kinetic energy and potential energy. So let's think about the kinetic energy of those particles. The kinetic energy would be their vibrational motion, perhaps their rotational motion, and in a gas, their translational motion. And when we think about the potential energy of these particles, they have potential energy because they're in fields. The important field that they're in is the field of one another. In other words, there's a potential energy there because of that bonding between the particles. So when we talk about the internal energy, we're talking about the sum over all particles of their kinetic energy plus their potential energy. 
So every particle's got some movement, it's got some bonding. So for each particle, we'd have a sum of kinetic energy and potential energy, but then we've got to take that and add it over all the particles in the whole object, and that would be the internal energy. Let's take a look at the second key concept, temperature. Now our intuitive notion of temperature is simply how hot something feels. But if we want to consider at the molecular level what's going on in a substance that feels hot, we'd have to consider the speed of those molecules. So we might have some particles that aren't moving at all, and some particles that are moving slowly, and some particles moving more and more quickly. But out of that, we could work out an average speed. And if we did that, the higher that average speed, the higher the temperature would be. But if we want to get more precise about it, we've got to consider energy. And temperature, temperature is really a measure of the average kinetic energy per molecule. In fact, a little later on in the course, we're going to study ideal gases. And when we do that, we'll get this equation in our data booklet. It says that the average kinetic energy of a molecule in the substance will be equal to some constant, and we'll learn more about that constant later, times the temperature. And the temperature has to be measured in Kelvin. What you want to keep in mind is that higher temperatures mean higher kinetic energies per molecule. And also keep in mind that the potential energy of the molecules doesn't affect the temperature. It's only the kinetic energy that affects the temperature. Here's an animation of a child sparkler. And I looked up on Wikipedia to find out what the temperature of one of those sparks would be. It turned out it should be somewhere between 1,000 degrees Celsius and 1,600 degrees Celsius. Now, you might be saying to yourself, we should never let children play with sparklers at birthday parties because that temperature is way too high and they're going to get burned. What I'd like you to do is think about that for a bit. Why do the children not get burned by these super high temperatures? Now, hopefully you gave an explanation along the lines of, sure, these sparklers, they have lots of kinetic energy per molecule. But if you want to find out the total amount of energy that has to be absorbed by the skin when a spark lands on it, you've got to multiply that by a small number of molecules, or at least relatively small. And when you do that multiplication, you're going to get a small amount of energy absorbed. Now, of course, if a big one kilogram spark flies off that sparkler, it's going to burn right through that kid. Now, the third concept that we wish to discuss is often called the heat or the heat energy, or sometimes I've seen it called the thermal energy. But we're probably best off simply calling it the transferred energy, because that's what it refers to, transferred energy. So for instance, if I have a candle and I heat some object up, there will be a transfer of energy. And usually we use a symbol Q to represent that transferred energy. Now let's try to put it all together and try to understand the relationship between the energy transferred, the temperature, and the internal energy. So imagine this is your hand. It would have a certain internal energy. Now I'll call it IE subscript H for the internal energy of your hand. And suppose this is a table. Then it would also have some internal energy. I'll call it IE T for the internal energy of the table. And let's suppose your hand is warm and the table is cold. What that means is that the molecules in your hand are going to be vibrating around more than the molecules in the table. So now suppose that you put your hand on the table. Then the big vibrations of the molecules in your hand are going to be right up against the smaller vibrations of the molecules in the table. And what that's going to do is cause the molecules in the table to shake around a little bit more, which means that the table's going to warm up a bit. So we'll have this transfer of energy, Q, 
and the internal energy of the hand is going to decrease by an amount Q. The internal energy of the table is going to increase by an amount Q. And the heat has to flow from the warm body, from the hot body, to the cold body. It wouldn't make any sense in reverse because the table would get colder and your hand would get hotter. And that becomes an important general rule. Energy is transferred from a higher temperature body to a lower temperature body. So temperature always tells us in what direction is the energy going to flow. And if the two bodies are at the same temperature, there won't be any net exchange of energy. Q will be zero. And so we often say that a thermometer measures its own temperature, which is to say, if I take my thermometer and place it into this bath of warm water, then a little bit of heat is going to flow from the water into the thermometer. And that will cause the liquid to rise a little bit, and it will keep rising until the temperature of the thermometer is equal to the temperature of the water. And that's when we take a reading of the water. Now, that's all going to work fine as long as our bulb is much smaller than our water bath. But let's suppose we have a big thermometer and a small water bath. Put the thermometer in, heat flows until the temperature of the thermometer is the same as the temperature of the bath. But in this case, the amount of heat that flows from the water is going to be quite significant. And so we're actually going to decrease the temperature of the water simply by measuring it. So if we want to measure the temperature of small things, we can't use a thermometer. We'd usually do it with an electric measurement using something like a thermistor. So summarizing that relationship, energy gets transferred from a high temperature object to a low temperature object. And that means the internal energy of the high temperature object is going to decrease by an amount Q. That means the kinetic energy is going to decrease, the molecule is going to move more slowly, and the potential energy is going to decrease, which means the molecules are going to get a little bit closer together. On the other side, the internal energy of the low temperature object is going to increase by an amount Q, and that means the molecules are going to move a little faster, have more kinetic energy, and the molecules are going to get a little bit more separated, and that's going to increase their potential energy. So that the internal energy of the low temperature substance increases by the same amount that the high temperature substance decreases. Okay, a few IB questions for you to try. Pause the video, read over the question, try it for yourself, come back for the answer. So in this first one, for two objects to be in thermal equilibrium, that means no energy is being transferred. And there's only no energy transferred when the two objects are at the same temperature. So the, so the correct answer here is D. Another IB question, read it over, try it out for yourself, come back for the answer. The key to this question is that we've got a insulated system. That means no heat can flow into or out of the system. So we've got our ice cube and we've got our water and there's going to be a flow of heat from the water to the ice cube. But there won't be any transfer of heat out of the system. And if there's no energy transferred out of the system, then the internal energy of the system has to be the same. So the correct answer is this one here. The internal energy of the system remains constant. Now there's one last concept that I want you to get. And it's a concept that's going to occur again and again when we discuss it, different types of potential energy. So I'd like to introduce it right now. Now we know the potential energy of the particles is related to their bonding. So we might think that if there's more bonding, there's more potential energy. So we ask the question, if there is more bonding and the particles are closer together, is there more potential energy? And the answer is a resounding no. And let's see why that is.
here's two particles. And I'm drawing them very far apart so that there's no interaction at all between those two particles. Now, it should be the case, if they're not interacting at all, that the potential energy has to be zero. There's got to be no bonding energy, no potential energy, when they're not interacting. Now, if we imagine them closer together, then, of course, there would be attractive forces holding them together. And if we wanted to separate them, if we wanted to set them free of one another so that their potential energy was zero, then we're going to have to do some work, exert some forces, and move them out and set them free. So what we say is, when they're close together, they have negative potential energy. They're trapping one another. And we have to do work to set them free. So the potential energy is increasing as we separate the particles. Just making up some numbers here, maybe when they're really close, the potential energy is minus 10. And then we move them apart, and over here somewhere, the potential energy is negative, say, negative 3 units. And then when we get them totally separated from them, the potential energy would be 0. So we're seeing an increase in potential energy, because the potential energy is becoming less negative. I find this little cartoon to be helpful in remembering that potential energy increases and becomes less negative as the particles move farther apart. It's kind of like an old couple that's been arguing and arguing for years. And so the more that that couple is separated, the less negative their relationship is. And another example for you. Imagine, say, a block of ice changing from solid to liquid to gas. We know the internal energy is composed of potential energy and kinetic energy. How would the distribution of potential and kinetic energy change as our cube went from solid to liquid to gas? Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So in the solid state, you've definitely got some kinetic energy, the molecules are vibrating around, and you've got some potential energy, of course it's going to be negative due to the bonding between the particles. Now as you move to a liquid, the kinetic energy is generally going to be higher. Now when the ice and the water are both at zero degrees, of course the kinetic energy would be the same because temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. And generally your potential energy is also going to increase meaning it's going to become less negative as the particles get farther apart. Now as you put in more energy and it becomes a gas, then at least in the case of an ideal gas, you're going to have zero potential energy. But remember here, that potential energy equals zero is an increase because it used to be negative. And of course there'll be a big increase in the kinetic energy except for when the liquid is at 100 and the steam is at 100, because again, if the temperature is the same, the kinetic energy's got to be the same. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.